Hello, English 1B students. Um, I want to do a little bit more with great short poems. Um, this is take four or five, I think. Uh, I did those two kiss poems, and I want to pick up on another poem. Just from the very first page, Sir Walter Raleigh's Even Such Is Time. This is a poem, so what Sir Walter Raleigh lived uh, in the Elizabethan period, Queen Elizabeth I of England, about the time uh, overlapping with um, William Shakespeare. Now, Even Such as Time is a short poem, and as I did with the Kiss Poems by Teasdale and Le Lee Hunt, I will type this up in part of the presentation for you um, in case you don't have the book. Um, it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight line poem, which works with uh, its rhyming in, in, in a certain pattern. And essentially, in the eight lines, you're going to have six negative lines and two positive lines. And it's talking about um, death. It's talking about what happens with time, what we lose. Remember, time's a thief, uh, Lee Hunt said in um, Jenny Kissed Me. Okay, and this is picking up much, much earlier, uh, a couple centuries earlier, um, the same sort of idea. So I'll read through it once, and then I'll walk through it. And again, this is meant to be a model of how poetry can do many things. And if we just look and, you know, keep our eyes and ears open, as it were, we'll see what we get. Now, this is a serious topic, which is mortality. Um, life and death, aging, decay what we lose. Okay, so it's a serious poem in that regard, certainly, and it's trying to offer a little bit of um, consolation, reassurance. It's meant to end on an up note, even though you might have six lines, which are essentially um, trying to capture in just the right words how life works, what we do lose. But let me do the poem. Even such is time. Even such is time that takes in trust our youth, our joys, our all we have, and pays us but with age and dust. Who, in the dark and silent grave, when we have wandered all our ways, shuts up the story of our days. But from this earth, this grave, this dust, my God shall raise me up, I trust. Okay. So it's building on that idea that, you know, anything, if you wait long enough, it will turn to dust, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, uh, as a phrase I grew up with. And the first six lines are actually one long sentence. Even such is time. Um, which, which might seem like a slightly odd phrasing for us. Um, it's trying to say, I, so time is this thing that. Even such is time. And then it takes it. What does time do? It takes and trust our youth, our joys, our all we have. It's sort of a banking metaphor. It takes and trust our youth, our joys, our all we have. I mean, it's, it's easy to think of with time we age, right? But, you know, the idea of losing joys, however you want to think about it. I mean, I tend to think that the longer I live, the more people I know are gone. Um... If I want to think in that in that sense of joys, I also want to think that, well, with uh, with lack of youth and strength, right? I can't, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't enjoy certain things as much as I used to. So to me, this is not meant to be like a lot of the poetry you're going to read. It's not meant to be surprising or shocking. It's meant to be well set, well constructed, and true. Time does do these things basically. So it takes certain things in trust. Our youth. Right, how young we are, our our joys, our our all we have. Ultimately, if you wait long enough, right, time will do that. And pays us. Remember, I said it's a banking metaphor. It takes these things in trust and pays us, but with age and dust. Only with old age, and then after that, death, re reduction to mere particles, dust. I'm kind of bummed out. Okay. Now, this poem is personifying death as, as something that can take and trust and pay. Okay. As if bank time is, this, to my mind, a, a sort of a, a stingy banker, as it were. Um, that's why it's who. 
okay, in the next line. Because time is, you think, well, who goes with a person? Well, time has been personified. Who in the dark and silent grave, when we have wandered all our ways, shuts up the story of our days. Now, these are sort of longer um, um, in terms of rhythm. The first four lines, the first three lines are a little sharper. And then with these three lines, I mean, all it's basically saying is, well, in the grave, I mean, we've got nothing. But notice the way life is presented. The want, how we went and we've wandered all our ways as if life is just like a random journey. I mean, that's actually kind of, I mean, to me, it, it, it smacks. And this is where it's emotional and resonant more than just logical, rational. Like if you're really contemplating the end of life and we might all, some of us might be doing that in these current circumstances. You know, you might think it was just, it wasn't a journey with a purpose. It was just wandering. Okay. And notice that it, we shuts up the story of our days. Like our life, this resonates with me because you know how much I like stories, but like, you know, who am I? Who is my identity? I mean, you know, I'm Matt Duckworth. I'm the guy who did these things, the story of my life. Um, it's a resonant, it, it's resonant for me. But I think of that, and I, you know, and if, if you think that, you know, you're remembered by the stories they tell about you, right? Even such is time that takes in trust, our youth, our joys, and our all we have, and pays us what but with age and dust, who in the dark and silent grave, when we have wandered all our ways, shuts up the story of our days. But from this earth, earth this grave, this dust, my God shall raise me up by trust. I'm not trying to proselytize. Um, Raleigh was a Christian. And here, but notice he doesn't say from, from death, I'll be raised up again. This is about the second coming. This is about judgment day and the good spirits being called up to rise again. But notice it didn't just say from death. It said this earth, this grave, this dust. Saying it three times to me is emphatic. For that deathly self, I mean, we might, I mean, if you were a Christian like Raleigh, you might have that faith that your soul will live. But, you know, as a human being, and Raleigh was executed, had his head chopped off for a crime, supposedly, against the crown of England. Um, and and the, the myth is, or the story is, he wrote this, um, revising an earlier poem, he, he wrote this version uh, the night before. Uh, he lost his life on the, on the, on the, you know, um, through execution. It's hard to let go of the body, you know, and the body's in the grave. The body's in the earth. The body's just dust. My God shall raise me up, I trust. We started with trust, the sort of taking in trust that time does and giving us a sort of poor reward back. But we end with a different sort of trust, uh, a, a sense of faith. Short poem, I think a lot is happening. Um, this is a poem that when I'm not really all that worried about age and mortality, didn't really interest me. I thought it was a clever poem when I read it in my, you know, at 20 years old. Uh, but I didn't feel the resonance that I feel now further along the line. Okay, let's do another death poem. Um, just the next page two and three, a famous poem by John Donne, um, who lived a little later than Raleigh. Um, they overlap. Um, Raleigh was what, about 18 years old when John Donne was born. John Donne lived a, um, a very varied life. Um, as a younger man, he was a sort of party dude, very, um, uh, enjoyed life quite a bit. Wrote enjoyable poetry about that kind of a life. Uh, was an assistant to a nobleman. And then got in trouble when he married someone the nobleman did not want him to marry. Lost his position. Did some things. Ended up becoming a, um, a preacher in the Protestant faith. Um, and, and wrote some amazing poetry and amazing sermons thereafter. This is one of his most famous poems. It's a sonnet, a 14-line poem. 
that rhymes in very particular ways. And it, again, a little bit like the poem we just looked at, it is, um, it's a rational, logical refutation of death. Raleigh offers his faith after six, even seven sort of lines about how we lose, lose, lose. Um, and then offers up the faith in God at the end to, to, as, a, as a support. And emotionally, I think that that dynamic is what works. Um, Dunn is more aggressive. Dunn is going to be attacking uh, sort of argumentatively like a lawyer. Death's claim to have power. You know, death rules over everything. Death takes us all. And again, I'm not trying to proselytize, but this is a Christian poem from a Christian culture. And in it, the counter is, well, no, in this case, Dunn's going to say, my soul lives on. You can't kill my soul. So therefore, you can't kill me, death. And so here, I mean, most of us are afraid of dying. Dunn had lived through a plague, a pandemic, um, as all the people in his period had done when they closed the theaters. And, you know, theoretically, Shakespeare went off and wrote his best works while, you know, sheltering in place um so dunn is going to take this on rationally now so the catch for me is you know a rational argument doesn't do much most of the time for an emotional anxiety you know say my fear of death uh, i'm just saying, oh yeah john dunn fixed it for me okay but maybe it helps maybe it helps to have somebody thinking it through and laying it out logically so that I can, I mean, you know, I, I teach books on survival in, in, in my 1A class sometimes. And one of the key things about survival is being in control of the emotional. Not, not, not being emotional, but being able to be in control of it. And one of the key things about that is when you're, you know, if you could, if you train, you start to panic, do a math problem, break it down coldly and logically. Um, you engage a different part of your brain. And so therefore you know you can access the training you've had and not letting yourself lose it okay um because you know fear of death anxiety about dying that's a serious thing and so just like raleigh dunn's gonna offer faith now you don't have to be a christian to appreciate this you might have a different faith in which you um believe in an afterlife or you believe in you know nothing at all in which case you might just shrug your shoulder and say i don't know why they're having a problem um you know i tend to believe in the transmigration of souls that we don't die with death we go on to something else what it might be i'm not sure okay okay death be not proud page two and three in here john dunn famous poem death be not proud okay don't be so proud death so it's taking it on talking to death the way Time was a character. Death is a character here. Personification. Death, be not proud. Though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinks thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death. Nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure. Then from thee much more must flow, and soonest our best men with thee do go rest of their bones and souls delivery thou art slave to fate chance kings and desperate men and dust with poison war and sickness dwell and poppier charms can make it sleep as well and better than thy stroke why swell'st though then one short sleep past we wake eternally and death shall be no more death thou shalt die bam i thought i had to be dramatic because it's a dramatic poem Okay, let's go back. So it's from the period of Shakespeare. So instead of you, you have thou and thee. Okay. Death, be not proud. You know, instead of like, I am master of the universe, death. Um, hey, don't be proud. That's done speaking. Some call thee mighty and dreadful. But you aren't. If we look at the truth of things. Okay, or look at his faith. For those whom thou thinkest thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me, nor can you kill me. Okay, because life everlasting is the real truth. Okay, so again, 
This is the, the, the religion of the poem. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be much pleasure. You know, sometimes people call, say, a, a sleeping like a little death. You know, so if you think about it, I mean, we get pleasure from relaxation. We get pleasure from sleep. So you know what, death? They're, they're, they're your pictures. They're, they're, they're the same. Like, they're, they're a version of you. And if we get good stuff from that, we probably get stuff from good stuff from, from death, from dying. You know, and our best people die. It's kind of like the good die young. Our best people go with you, and then they, they get to, their body gets to rest. They no longer have to struggle in this life, rest of their bones, and soul's delivery. You know, they may die mortally, but their soul will live on. They'll go to heaven. And you know what? If we, Let's get down to this. You know what? You're slave to fate. You don't choose who dies. Fate does. Chance does. Kings do. And desperate men. You know, if, the, if that outlaw shows up and shoots somebody, you didn't decide that. That desperate guy did. And that other poor fellow's dead now. Okay, this is being compressed. This is the thing about a poem like this is compressed into a list. And we're invited, uh, we're required in a certain sense to, if we want to make sense of it, we have to imagine how it would work. And dust, and you do, that's what and dust means. And you do with poison, war, and sickness dwell. I mean, look at your best friends. Look at, look at who you hang out with. War, poison, sickness. Like... You used to go around strutting death. You know, you're so proud, but really? I mean, look at how subservient you are. Look where you hang out. Okay, this is, this is done using uh, associations in order to make us feel better or make us fear death a little less. Okay. And, okay, and then we had a semicolon there. And Poppy or charms can make us sleep as well. Poppy would be, um, you know, like morphine, a distillant, some sort of distillant, which would, medicine that would, and charms, those are both meant to be medicines that would help us sleep. You know, death makes you sleep, but you know what? These things do too. Again, it's trying to do that minimization of death's power and autonomy. And, and those things work, he claims, better than thy stroke, okay? Okay, I have a problem with this logically. Like, no, no, no. Death makes us sleep forever in this metaphor. I'm sorry. Uh, taking some opium or morphine might knock me out for a while, but it's not exactly going to... Okay, but, you know, this is part of the dramatic delivery. In this case, you might even think of this as a character in a Shakespeare play, you know, and there's death for the character trying to be tough and mean and scary, and um, the Dunn character is trying to, like, talk him down. Okay, and so sometimes when you're making an argument, you might exaggerate for effect. I think Dunn's doing that here. And poppy and char or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Why swell'st thou then? Why do you get all puffed up as if you're so proud? I mean, I could take a drug, you know, and knock myself out. One short sleep past, we wake eternally. And death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Okay, you know, we die, we go to heaven. Okay, he doesn't really bring up, okay, the heaven or hell isn't being brought up. But obviously this is meant to say, like, you know, we wake eternally. And we're not making a transition into the terrors of hell in this poem. I think the idea is that just like we had our best men with thee do go. The idea of, like, we're going to go to heaven. Because, you know, this poem is for the for the good of us, right? And, and that beneficent God that's going to, you know, uh, forgive and, and raise people up. It's meant to be a poem of faith. It's meant to be a poem of consolation. I don't know if it works for you or not. I don't know. You know, again, it's, a, it's an assertion. It's a declaration. It's an argument. Um, death be not proud. Okay. I mean, in some ways, both poems go to that heart of if you have that faith, then we shouldn't be sad at, at a funeral, say, or if someone dies young, because if you had this faith, right, they go on. Um, but, you know, you might have the strongest faith in the world, but you don't want to lose your, your friend, your family member, 
here and now. You know, not yet, not yet. Okay, I've got one more poem. I know this is going a little long. I got one more poem. Unfortunately, again, it's about death, but it's about this last attitude of don't hurry, don't give in, don't let it go. Now, there are many cases where your will doesn't matter. You know, you can only resist so much, but this is a poem that calls that up. And it's also a poem. It's called A Villanelle, the Style. And it's actually the very last poem in the book. We started with the first, and now we're going to the last. It's by um, Dylan Thomas, a Welsh poet, who lived in the early um, 20th century. It's called Do, no, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Now, the poem is really about he doesn't want his father to die. He doesn't want his father to lose the will to live. But it starts off far more generally, and a lot of poems do this, a lot of songs will do this, where they'll start off as if they're talking about the world, and then it's like talking about the self. And to me, that's not a selfish reduction. It is, um, it works on both levels. I mean, these things work for, for the way in which, um, you know, sort of a larger general generalized idea of something and then the personal angle and while he is speaking about his father if my father were alive I could be speaking about my father or thinking about him as I read it or I might be thinking about other other friends and family ones I dearly love um, it's got a lot of repetition built into it it's a very song-like poem a villanelle and if you're interested in that form, let me know and I'll tell you more. Okay. Do not go gentle into that good night. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Okay, let me pause here for a moment. Um, so it's using almost like sunset, the end of the day is the end of life you know rage against the dying of the light you know the sun is setting but you don't have to set too okay so the light is like a metaphor for it's a one day's journey that's what life is it's also say the inner light the inner energy don't let it go don't let it fade okay do not go gentle into that good night Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end, no dark is right. Because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men, who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned to wait late. They grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, And you, my father, and you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Okay, I'm not going to redo this. And I had hoped not to, to get emotional, but I've been thinking deeply about my best friend today who died too young. Okay. I'm not thinking, he's, he wasn't my father. He was my friend. He was, uh, you know, a couple months younger than I was, and he died too young. This is part of the power of poetry. Reading Dylan Thomas's poem and he gets to the part where his father, he doesn't want his father. Like, bless me, curse me. Here I am, I'm telling you, don't let go, old man. 
And you might say, bless me, or you might curse me, like, let me go, I want to go. But the son here doesn't want the father to die. He doesn't care if it pisses off the father, excuse me, or it pleases the father, that expression. Just rage. Okay. Now, part of our reaction to poetry is straight up, you know, makes me think of my dad. But the other thing is the way in which I can be transported to the sadness I feel for the loss of a good friend. Poetry is not bloodless. And the act of literature, this is the part that's beyond teaching to the test. This is beyond which character did what. It's meant to make us feel as well as think, you know. Cyrano in Act 5, faithfully going to see Roxanne for 15 years. And Christian's been dead all that time, and he can't say anything, because how could he say, I was really that guy? Okay? He just can't. Why should she believe him? Also, well, we'll talk about this another in another video. But also my point would be that, you know, I could even think of Cyrano raging against the dying of the light. You know, the way in which he's going to go down with that sword in hand fighting death. Because that's what he does. We don't end on the note of love. The love is there. Instead, he's got that old adversity. Okay. Hope you're all doing well.